afternoon. Um, when I saw the schedule for this afternoon and I saw that I was due to follow the Pranav Mystery video, um, my heart sank a bit because I know just what a big impact the Sixth Sense thing had on me when I first saw it. But as I sat there now this afternoon, I thought, actually, it's okay. I, I don't mind because, in a way, what Pranav Mystery was here talking about um, was a good way for actually getting a message across that says, and this is why education has to be changing and has to be serious about reform. And also to follow my very good friend, Kiran Seti, um, who lives and embod embodies so much of what can be done within education today. I'm also slightly daunted um, because I can imagine that within the audience here, there's a much higher than normal proportion of people who are successes from the existing traditional education system. I'm sure there's a very high proportion of high qualifications in this room, and therefore, I stand here with full knowledge that some of what I'm going to be talking about in the next few minutes may antagonize a few, perhaps those particularly who are not inclined, perhaps, to feel that the change is particularly needed. Education, I believe, is one of the most important issues to be addressed in this country in the next five to ten years. And there are real dangers. When we see one of the most important pieces of legislation in the educational area, it's actually going to be passed into law on the 1st of April, when it was debated in Parliament, it got a debate of about two hours, with less than 25% of the politicians present. That suggests that we're not taking education seriously enough. And when we see this statistic, we really have to wonder why we're not taking it seriously. When are we going to wake up to really what needs to be addressed? Back in December, I was attending a conference in Ahmedabad. Uh, funnily enough, actually arranged by Kiran Seti School. The highlight of that whole conference was a two-hour video conference on the Saturday evening with Professor Howard Gardner of Harvard. And we got the opportunity to put questions to him. And the question that I put, which actually when it was read out, um, and it was read out by a very prominent educator uh, with a very long history, very long and illustrious history, who actually read it out with a certain sneer in their voice, as though somehow by asking this question, someone was being a little bit silly. Until, but they shut up pretty quickly when they heard Howard's answer. It should be. But, put up with it, you're going to be able to recognize a school as a school, as you and I all knew it, for some time yet. The trouble is things like this. The fact is that students are playing a game, and it's a game that hasn't really changed in 30 years. I played the same game. The trouble is in most times, this is one of my favorite sayings, if you always do what you always did, you'll always get what you always got. But in this case it's worse because if the world's changed, you won't even get what you used to get. And whatever you get will be less and less relevant. When we look back in the, the history of how did we get to where we are today, how did education arrive at the point where we are? And we come across things like this. This was quoted by John Taylor Gatto in A Different Kind of Teacher, which was published around 2000. He says, in our dreams, well, he's, he's quoting J.D. Rockefeller of the General Education Board in the US. In our dreams, people yield themselves with perfect docility to our molding hands. What beautiful words to inspire. What a wonderful thing to do to future generations, to mold them docilely. As Daniel Pink says, the main crisis in school today is irrelevance. What's the evidence for that? Well, in the US, higher spend per student, reduced class sizes, 
No improvement in literacy rates in the last 15 years. Literacy, for crying out loud, the most fundamental, simple skill that we barely are hardly even ready to, to even contemplate. Teachers simply teach to tests. And in the economic downturn, cut all the co-curricular activities, cut the physical activity, cut the drama, cut the dance, cut the music. In the UK, rising dropout rates, increasing violence against teachers, testing children to test teacher achievement because the teachers can't be trusted. So we must have more tests for children so that we can check on the teachers. Sorry, kids. And dumb down academic standards. And I don't care how many civil servants stand up and deny it. An A-level is not the same as the A-level when I went to school. The US, again. My course is interesting. 21%, truly pathetic. Schoolwork is meaningful. 28%. Schoolwork will have some bearing on the success I have in my life, a mere 39%. So let's look at India. These are a variety of statistics taken from different sources. But some examples here, emphasis. They say they've interviewed 1.3 million people for jobs and found only 2% of them qualified to take up positions. And last year, extended the duration of their pre-service training because they believed that they were having to lower their standards in terms of what they were taking on. A McKinsey study suggesting 10 to 25% of graduates employable in the country. These are difficult statistics to stomach. 300,000 engineering diplomas per annum, 25% competent to work. Not even quite sure here what competent to work even means. 50% of technology grads, not good enough. What on earth is going on in our education system? As educators, we have to ask ourselves some very hard questions, and it's really, at times, difficult to look ourselves in the eye. This is one I loved. We interrupt classes with public address system announcements, utterly forgetting that Hamlet's soliloquy may lose something from the interjection of information about where the cheer cheerleaders should meet after school. <laughs> There's nonsense going on in our schools, but at least it keeps our children off the streets. Again, John Taylor Gatto, 2000. This one is interesting because it's obviously out of date. But we ignored it in 2000, and there's a very real danger if we're not careful, we'll ignore everything again in 2010. The best evidence our schools are set up to school and not be useful educationally lies in the look of the rooms where we confine kids. I love that word, confine. Rooms with no clocks, no telephones, no fax machines. No stamps, no envelopes, no maps, no directories, no private space in which to think, no conference tables on which to confer. In fact, conferring is called cheating. <laughs> Rooms in which there isn't any real way to contact the outside world where life is going on. Now, many people say, oh, go. OK, now, all schools got internet on computers in a lab. Some recent data I saw from America, the average Junior school child gets to spend 24 minutes a week interacting on a computer. In senior school, it's much better. 34 minutes. <laughs> there are many stakeholders involved in education, and that's one of the things that makes it a little challenging and a little bit complex. One of the important stakeholders is parents. Here in India, we have a scenario right now where parents say things like this which basically interprets as, yeah, OK, do the progressive stuff, do the imaginative stuff, do the innovative stuff, do the kind of stuff that Kieran was talking about in junior school with the younger children. But in senior school, board exams. <laughs> Percentages. You know, I have a friend who's a, a trainer who trains teachers. And he, he interacts with lots of schools. And they'll say, please, come and train our teachers. OK, so how many teachers do you have from grade 1 to 12? Oh, no, 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 not 1 to 12, 1 to 8. The 9s to 12s, they, they, they're, they're busy. A 
I shouldn't be too condemning of teachers, or should I? This is interesting. I believe Ahmedabad is at 23 degrees... Sorry. I believe Ahmedabad is at 23 degrees, degrees latitude. This is, this is a true conversation. The question, obviously, why? Because I read that it has an average temperature of 23 degrees. Um, interesting idea, especially when you discover that it comes from somebody with two bachelor's degrees and a master's degree. <laughs> But it gets worse. One of those bachelor's degrees is a B.Ed. This is a geography teacher. <laughs> if we're going to reform the education system, now is the time and the opportunities are there. And we need to essentially address five key areas. The first of those areas is curriculum. The second, assessment, teacher education, community engagement, and the final one that I've added, because I think it's also crucial, infrastructure and delivery mechanisms. The first point that I would want to make, and I think it's, it's only right and relevant when we're here, going digital is no option. It's a no-brainer. And I think Prinsky sums it up very well here, in this, this reference to digital immigrants and how we interact and communicate and, as he says, reach digital natives, and the time for belly aching, the time for grousing, the time for talking about, well, of course, someone's going to have to put me on a course for that, is over. It's time to just do it. ICT in education is not showing a film or telling students to find some facts on the internet. When it comes to the finding facts on the internet, there's some interesting work being going on. Around the world now, quite a number of teachers have uh, produced a number of, of very interesting websites. If you go on the net and, and uh, put into Google uh, fake websites for education, you'll find there's a whole variety. And they've been produced for a reason. They set the students up with a task and say, go find answers to these questions from the internet. And the children inevitably find their way to these fake websites where they blindly take down everything it says and treat it as though it's gospel and put it into neat projects and present it as they work. No discernment means no learning. It is, though, about collaborative online projects on a local basis, on a national basis, on a global basis. It is about wikis, blogs, podcasts, Moodle, Illuminate, GPS, Flip, Twitter, as was mentioned earlier, VLEs. It's also about TED. But I don't know how many know. Ted is blocked in a lot of schools by the firewalls, and on the firewall, it comes up political. <laughs> so, you didn't know it, but you're all here engaged in a political activity this afternoon. <laughs> Apparently. I believe that there's a technology dividend opportunity, and we need to grab it. Indian schools are not overly saddled with legacy hardware and software. That was the bad news of the past, but it's also good news now. You go into most Western schools, they can't afford necessarily to just junk and throw away machinery which is still basically functional, but actually limits their ability to move on. The progress of, of FOSS as a game changer in education really appeals within the education environment, and especially here within India, where we need to look at value for our money. The scope for economies combined with quality, what I would mean here is really, without going into a lot of the detail, especially when we're working with secondary age children, and this is particularly the point that's brought across by Christensen in, in the book that I've made reference to here. There's a lot of what is learned which does not actually require a teacher in a classroom. And when we start to think in those terms, we can start to say, for example, right, let's take maths and separate out some bits of the curriculum, or some bits of the syllabus which are actually better taught by self-learning by the child or the student individually, with a, a tutor monitoring them. You know, okay, you were meant to spend this many hours online this week. Uh, I can see you only did 60%, so what are you going to do about it next week? And there are other parts that lend themselves to interaction and time in the classroom together. There are even whole subjects where right now schools can't afford to offer them. And so schools acquiesce in this whole thing of students being pigeonholed into doing science or humanities or whatever, instead of being able to offer full, rich variety 
and to say, take the subjects that really ignite your passion, that really get your interest, and, and explore them. The others I can't go into too much today, but we may have some bad roads here, we may have some problems with connectivity in other ways, but what we do have, although I guess we may soon not have if they take down all the illegal towers, uh, is a fairly good mobile network. And that mobile network is really not being used enough yet, and it offers opportunities for those who've got the imagination to uh, get into how it can be used. Community radio, again, as well. Um, the surface is only being just, we're just scratching the surface at the beginning. And the edges out there, there's a long tragic story. Five years ago, the world applauded India when this satellite was launched. It was a big news event all over the world that India was launching a satellite purely for the purpose of education. If you go back and talk to some of the pioneers who were involved with that initial work five years ago, some of them almost burst into tears now. They are frustrated, they are disappointed, because as yet the country has only probably realized about 10% of the benefits of actually putting that satellite up there. There's a couple more years yet of, of, of good life still left in it, and it's not too late if people have repaired to compromise a little. There were some fundamental problems about the fact that it had to have dedicated hardware at the receiving point, which cost six to 8,000 rupees a time. So immediately you can see where the hurdle comes. That was so you could have the two-way interactivity. If you're prepared to sacrifice on some of the two-way interactivity, then you can have something that can actually deliver a lot of uh, information and knowledge to a lot of people, at least for the next two or three years. I believe that it is time for an Indian curriculum for the 21st century. And when I say curriculum here, we need to be careful not to be confusing syllabus and curriculum as the media have been doing during the last few weeks when they've been talking about the HRD ministry's plans as far as maths and science. A syllabus is a body of knowledge to be learned, essentially. A curriculum is the entire gamut of, of the experience that the student is going to have. And I would suggest that one of the keys to arriving at a 21st century curriculum is that all stakeholders need to be a part of it. It's not about, okay, educators, that looks like a good idea, go ahead. All the stakeholders have got to be a part of coming up with what exactly would go into these four key boxes. But I do believe that they are the, the key boxes. Core subjects and cross-curricular themes. Lifelong learning and creativity skills. Information, media, and technology skills. And personal and professional success skills. It's about what can I do, not what do I know. I think the Pran of Mystery example is perfect People ask me today, what's your phone number? I can't, I can't remember. I don't need to know my phone number anymore. I don't need to know my wife's phone number or my mother's. Yeah, 20 years ago, I'd have been carrying all, around, all that stuff around in my head. But what we're seeing is, and children as well are asking this question, when I can just go and Google this information, why do I have to have it at my fingertips all the time? We can look at depth over quantity, and we can look at skills and literacies. The skills and the literacies are what begin to address those questions that are being raised by people like Infosys about employability. We look at global, financial and entrepreneurial citizenship skills. Last election, 10% of young eligible voters in this country voted. There's a, a gulf, I believe, between the willingness within the society to balance one's personal rights and interests with collective and group rights and interests. And in a country with one billion people, that's extremely dangerous. Information, media, and ICT skills. Flexibility, initiative, self-direction, social skills, cross-cultural skills, productivity, leadership. The list can go on. But that's a curriculum. That's something that you can actually build and say, Yes, if we can achieve this for all students, then we have progress. And the key is as well, all students. What we have right now is a system whereby we mask most of its problems by talking about its narrow successes. Assessment, I won't go into in too much detail, but we have to assess for learning, not assess, do assessment of learning. Assessment of learning is like deciding that you're going to rear chickens 
and going and cracking the eggs open at once every hour to see if the chicks inside are growing. It's the tests, the exams, summative, final assessment. It causes a child to grow up with a set of beliefs that says that learning fits in neat little boxes which you memorize for a period of time, and then you take a test and then you forget it all and it doesn't matter, and it makes no sense. Instead, school has to be understood by all as the early steps in a lifelong learning process. And, as I said earlier, assessment cannot and should not be for checking up on the teachers. Instead, we need far more sophisticated and broad ways of assessing demonstration of skills and competence development, that competence is moving forward. Because when you start to measure moving forward instead of reaching, reaching certain points, then you can assess everybody and you can assess everybody effectively. Teachers. Probably one of the biggest and fundamental changes is that we have to start caring more about children than we care about the knowledge that we accumulated in college so that we could go into class and spout it out. I get saddened when I meet so many teachers who say, yes, I've been teaching for 10 years. And you go and sit in their classes and you think, no, you haven't taught for 10 years. You've taught once, 10 times over. The wise uncles, maybe it's a cultural thing. I spent some time some years ago, uh, back in about 2000, uh, I was putting together English curriculum for a medical transcription company. At that time, medical transcription was, was dead hot. Only what I realized within two or three months was that actually it was about to kill itself, um, at least in the short term, because there were mis massive dislocations between quality of work and expectation of clients, and uh, too many people had gone into it too quickly, etc., etc. But this training institute had big, ambitious plans in terms of how many students it was going to take in. Now, I'd already given my resignation and I was going to leave within a month, but I was still there and I still had to do my job. And I was asked to interview students who were coming to join the course. And for a whole day, they were coming one after the other. So why do you want to do medical transcription training? My uncle says it would be a good idea. I felt like screaming at them, your uncle doesn't know diddly squit. Why are you listening to your uncle? You're the one that is growing up in the 21st century. Your uncle was a man of the last century. And your uncle's picking up scraps and bits of information and showing you how clever and wise he is. And I'm afraid you shouldn't be listening to him anymore. But there is vast potential. Guess it. And, but it's time to professionalize. We can't wholly blame teachers. If there are teachers in the room and they think I've been bashing a bit, there are some problems. For one, where are the mechanisms in the country to develop leaders for teachers? to develop leaders for the educational profession. I've given two examples here. In the UK, they have something called the National College of School Leadership. In the US, the Wallace Foundation. There are specialized MBA courses specifically for people who are going to be leaders in education. What do we have here? We have a summer course that runs in IIM Ahmedabad or CBSE principals who are normally told they have to go there and don't like it because it means they lose their summer vacation. There have to be realistic routes into education and into teaching that come from a far broader range of directions. We've got to start bringing more people from more varied backgrounds. You know, if I look at myself and I compare with someone maybe who went straight into education, I believe that that, that detour via other things helped me ultimately to be a better teacher and a better educator once I got there. And I'm afraid some things are going offline at the moment. There's talk of making the pre-service training for teachers longer, because that will make them better before they go in the classroom. No, it won't. In fact, there'll be less of them, because most coming from, many of them coming from lower socio, uh, socioeconomic classes will not be able to wait that long to earn some money. So they just won't come to the profession in the first place. What we need is a committed process that trains people both before and during the early years and the mid-years of, of their teacher training. I've mentioned the vitality of community in all this. Parents in this country have massively high aspirations for their children. 
Most educators run away from that and hide. Shut the doors, they don't want to hear it because, oh, they're just going to give me so much grief. We do need to listen and we need to tap into those high aspirations. If we need to help parents and guide them to ask better questions, then that's our job within education. And if we don't take it on, and instead we just reduce the communication, then we fail them and we fail their children. Students, especially older students within schools, have a desire for genuine voice. And that's an aspect that needs to begin to change within education. Not just token voice, but real genuine voice in what's happening in, in their world. They want meaningful tasks, and they want learning that represents a real, true uh, connection with the real world. We need to engage with wider communities about funding and finance for education. And we need to engage as well with business and HR. Unfortunately, right now, we do have a problem in the country where many HR departments of companies do recruitment by numbers. They advertise jobs, the CVs come in, they're given to somebody relatively junior who goes, good college, interview, oh no, never even heard of that college, reject. Good percentage, on the good pile, no, his percentage is poor, put it out of the way. It's too simplistic. There have to be more sophisticated ways of finding the talent that organizations need, and if they work together with education, that can be achieved. The tertiary education sector, because that's a sector as well that wants to change, as well as schools, but that change has to go hand in glove. It can't be that one tries to change and the other stays unchanging. So the two need to move together. And schools and communities need to come together. Unfortunately, and very sadly, people like me actually finish up spending a lot of our time dealing with legal issues where community is continually being confrontational because of the inconvenience of having schools in their neighborhoods. And the challenge, the very people who are trying to change the system are successful products of that system. I mentioned it before in terms of the audience here, but also Educators, you go into a school like mine and you look down, masters, masters, doctorate, doctorate, masters, masters, doctorate, doctorate, doctorate. These are people for whom luck was on their side. And their ways of thinking, the ways their minds worked, fit okay and fit well with the way the education system was offering a one size fits all. We need to start asking questions, what will a school look like? Not just build it and then try and turn it into a school, but come at it from the other way around. What spaces do we want for people to learn in and then build and design around those desires and the learning needs? There are economic opportunities, but there are all sorts of philosophical issues. You know, in some states, it's considered that a philanthropist or an industrialist puts 70 crore or so into building a new school that person is allowed to set up a structure whereby the revenues at least cover the costs, the running costs, but they mustn't ever do anything that hints at collecting any of that 70 crore. Flexible time, flexible activity, and flexible spaces. I mentioned earlier, tannoy announcements in the middle of lessons. Also, we need to even ask questions about whether all learning has to be done with an age cohort. Why? Learning is happening at different paces for different people, and different people have got different interests. Open all hours. It sometimes seems a tragedy to me in a place where resources are, are limited, that we put all these resources in place, and by and large, they're used for about 30 hours a week. Inclusive. A society built on separation and division has inevitable long-term weaknesses. And we must design around expectations of collaboration, not that collaboration will be a rarity. And then perhaps we'll finish up with some educational environments a little more like that. The price of failure can't even really be contemplated in my view. It's economic on a massive scale. It's also social. The frustrations, the, the levels of dissatisfaction, and the inadequacies of the system can only grow from here if we don't do something about them. 
And so we must, and it requires bravery and imagination, and it requires, as I said, all stakeholders to come and share their thoughts and share their ideas and share their innovations. The risks are also political and they are humanitarian. So failure, not an option. We have to reform and we have to reform soon. If we can do so, then I believe that the demographic dividend is going to provide vast and enormous opportunities for the country, and that's why I live here. But that also is a reflection of the fact that I believe we can do it, but it's not going to be easy, and it does have a lot of challenges, and I have to say, probably in the last 10 years, we've not made the best of starts, so we need to get to work. Thank you.